Okay, I'm unmuted. <laughs> so hello to everybody and good morning uh, for you. For me, it's like good afternoon because I am um, Eastern Standard Time. And I think there are some people for whom this is good evening because I think there are people share, uh, coming from, uh, joining us from Israel. So um, like um, Gal said before, if you have any questions, if you want to send them in by chat, Christina is going to uh, look at them and um, then at the end, the last 15 minutes or so, uh, we can, um, you can, she'll ask me the questions for you and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, we're going to talk today about um, challenges in adoptions of traumatized children. And um, some of this obviously is not going to be, it's, it's going to be short in the sense that there's a lot to say about adoptions. It's a very big topic with a lot of different facets to it. But um, I hope that we can sort of have a bit of a taste of some of the challenges that uh, adoptions uh, bring up for families and for children. And um, when I talk about challenges for traumatized children, there are different levels of trauma. But I think that one of the things to remember and to keep in mind is that almost by definition, children who are adopted have had uh, an experience of trauma, even if it is the disruption of attachment and having to deal with some of the aspects of um, uncertainty and confusion or belonging and so on. So we're going to talk more specifically about that today. So, um, so if we're talking about the complexities of adoption, we're talking about a lot of different things that come in with it. So. Obviously, adoption is a, a wonderful opportunity for people, for children to have a home. And I, I apologize ahead of time for the sirens. This is New York City and we're um, still in the middle of a bit of a crisis here. So um, if there are sirens outside, it's okay. It's just ambulances having to cross. So part of the um, complexities that come with adoption are the very the many different feelings that are evoked by the process itself so for example we we know that there's a lot of relief uh, parents and children express relief over the fact that finally it's done it's over it's complete it's finalized they don't have to worry that there's going to be a change of placement they don't have to they have some control over the child's life now rather than having to worry that things are going to change or shift or that agencies might change their might might have different regulations or that there are going to be some things that won't work out uh, there is a sense of stability in how uh, now we, you know that this is your home and this is where you can stay and this is where you can foresee a future, which is something that is very difficult to do for children while they're waiting to be adopted and they don't really know whether they're going to have stability in the future or not. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's a sense of hope that now we can start afresh, we can start new, we can leave the bad times behind, we can, there's, uh, it's going to be better now. Uh, that we're safer now, that hopefully it's a safe home and uh, safe also from the disruption of another placement, uh, which sometimes does happen, unfortunately, even after adoption. But part of what comes with the finalization of adoption is often a sense of safety. And um, there's also a lot of expectation, which can be a double-edged sword because we have the expectation that now it will be fine that now the hard part is over and now um, everything is going to be okay and we can have the perfect family. Uh, there, the, there's also the um, other side of that of expectations that are sometimes unrealistic, uh, that children think that now everything's going to be okay. They're going to get their perfect family with their perfect parents, uh, which no parent can be. And um, the parents might have an expectation that they'll get the perfect child and that they're going to have a perfect adoptive family or that things are going to be okay from now on. And many times there are in, to a degree, but there's also the reality that expectation brings the possibility of uh, disappointment. And for children who had already experienced disappointment, it can be amplified even in, in small, um, for small things. Children and families also deal with loss, especially the children deal with the, with the loss of the family that could have been. 
uh, when adoptions are finalized, children are faced with the reality that what they might have dreamt maybe could happen with the biological family that would somehow become what they need is not going to happen. Uh, there can be confusion about um, how to how to manage, how to identify oneself. Do you forget about what happened before? Do you only use your new last name? Do you keep something from the name or identity that you had before? How are you supposed to relate to your family of origin, uh, to maybe relatives or friends that you had from before? And oftentimes there's the complexities of grief and anger that might not have been able to be expressed before the adoption was finalized because it, it, there was no room for it beforehand. Um, and in some ways, the stability and the relief of the adoption itself can bring up grief and anger that need to be processed. And they're not always, children and families are not always ready for it, which can uh, add complexity to the issue. Um, on top of that, there is no cookie cutter way that adoptive children behave. There's no one way that parents can say, okay, this is what I can expect. There are a lot of different things that can happen and oftentimes contradicting things or not exactly the way parents or children, but parents might have seen it, might have expected it to be. And um, families don't always know what to make of the behaviors they see. Uh, it could be families that say that the I want to hold him, but he doesn't let me hold him or she won't let me put her down. He, he keeps breaking all the rules or he is, never breaks the rule. I want him to know that it's safe to, to oppose me. I want him to know that it's safe to have his own opinion and yet he never breaks a rule. Or children who run away or refuse to leave the house or children that have issues with neediness or over-independence that parents are not sure how to address that. So they are, there are different conflicting behaviors sometimes that um, if parents and families are not ready for them, they can add challenges to the adoption, uh, post-adoption. So I wanna share some, some things that parents share with me and share with colleagues of mine over the years. Those are disguised, but um, they have to, like parents are describing different aspects of what of the challenges that they're facing or the expectations that they have and the questions that they have. Um, she was the sweetest. Now she's a nightmare. We want the sweet girl we adopted back. And this is something that comes up often that you see behavior changes that actually might be part of the child finally feeling safe to show more of who they are, uh, but it's not necessarily comfortable or easy. They said she's 18 months old. Doc says at least a year older. What else don't we know? And that is a reality that a lot of families are dealing with that adds challenges when you don't know what the history is and you don't even have information like the exact, the actual age of the child. She's one of us now. She should be able to leave her old life behind. And that's an understandable dream, but it's also uh, difficult when there is that hope that wish to not have any of that past interfere, and yet that past is part of the child's life. Everyone says something else, autism, not autism, ADHD, not ADHD, conduct disorder, learning disorder, reactive attachment disorder. Are we supposed to just pick one? Um, a lot of kids who come into adoptive families bring other issues with them, and it's not always clear what the diagnoses are uh, sometimes it's not clear until much later into the process. Um, and oftentimes, too often, trauma is not taken enough into account. We never know what can set him off. These aren't normal tantrums. He gets scary. She's playing us against each other. Why would she try to destroy our family? Now, we can have our own thoughts about why a child would try to test to see if the family that they're in now is actually going to hold and if it's really going to stand the test of difficulty and the test of the feelings that the child has or what the child expects needs to happen because that's the way families are to them. Love has no price tag, but how are we supposed to afford all the therapies he needs? And that's a recurrent issue that comes up when it comes to um, 
children who leave the foster care system and they're adopted, the burden often trans is transferred to the parents when it comes to providing care for the child and the different therapies that children need. And sometimes it's more than what families thought they would need to deal with. And it's not for lack of love, but it add, does add stress to the relationship. And the p children pick up on that and sometimes feel that they are too much and that the family stretch too much and so on. They said patience and they said, give it time. It's been two years. Um, a lot of parents feel that there is little, too little support in the long term, that there is support right after, but there's too little support in the long term and they're not quite sure what the roadmap can be for what they actually need to do other than offer a lot of love and patience. I thought it would be different. I bet she thought it would be different. What went wrong? How can anyone miss that awful place? Does are the, there are often children who miss their biological parents, even abusive parents. They might miss um, their orphanage that they grew up in, even though to us it might look like the last place on earth that anybody would want to be, but it had been their home. He brings out the worst in me. I hate myself for having thoughts of sending him back. That's a reality that's often taboo, but it's important to talk about because there are uh, adoptions that dissolve and there are ways to help prevent um, adoptions from dissolving um, with more support and with opening up some of those uh, challenges to, to be discussed, to be verbalized. So when we're looking at the uh, behaviors and the parents and what the parents are describing the children's behavior, I think it's important to remember, and me as a speech language pathologist, communication is everything to me. So, but I, I really do believe that all behavior is communication. Our behavior is communication. And not all communication is necessarily verbal or language-based, but we communicate our content and discontent, our boredom, our annoyance, uh, our needs uh, through a lot of times through our behavior, even uh, when we're using words, sometimes our words match our behavior and sometimes our words don't match our behavior, uh, but it is all of it, communication. And when we're looking at the adoption of traumatized children, we want to think about their behaviors through questions that we ask ourselves about what they're trying to communicate to us. So we might want to think about what did they learn about the world, about relationships, about connection, about consequences, about what to expect from people. What do they know about us, about themselves, about how the world works, about uh, what safety means? How do we know what they know? How do we know that what we're making assumptions about is what really the children are experiencing when oftentimes kids don't have words for exactly what they're feeling. But we need to be aware that what we are assuming may not always be the child's experience. Because we want to also take into account what the child missed as, as part of the, the period of time that they were in the adoption process or the period of time that brought them into the adoption process. There were things in normal development that they did not have their connections and um, assumptions about the world and a sense of ability to use others to regulate and, and what their own value is and what to expect from others that they might have not had a chance to really learn the way we would think children would learn it or the way we expect children to learn by that age. But by that age. And we might be missing information from the child about what they're trying to communicate because we're seeing it through our own lens of what we think about the world and what we expect them to know. So we have to try and put ourselves in their shoes to a degree to try and understand how they interpret connection and how we can help expand and repair some of the assumptions that they made. They did not make wrong assumptions. They made assumptions based on the world they were exposed to and the interactions that they had it's just that some assumptions about connection and care and love and permanence and safety may not be um, enough now that their world has changed and they can expand their assumptions about how the world works and what love means 
and what parents can and cannot do and what power they have and do not have in the world. So when we're looking at um, trauma, and like I said before, by almost by definition, a child who is adopted is a child who had experienced some form of trauma, almost by definition. Um, if only the, the not knowing and the having to adapt to um, attachment disruptions and so forth and dealing with loss. So when we're looking at trauma, we wanna think about, we wanna remember that it is overwhelming. It exceeds what a child can usually cope with on their own or a person. It is very isolating, especially to children who are say in the foster care system or are waiting for an adoption. And there, there's nobody really knows how they are feeling and what they're experiencing. And the trauma the children experience uh, is often very confusing. They don't have a context for it. They don't have a way to understand it other than taking it on, onto themselves, taking blame on themselves. It can be terrifying and dysregulating. So they have a hard time regulating their own reactions, even in times outside trauma, because traumatic experiences alter the way our brain experiences other experiences that are not traumatic and the way uh, we can process information and the way we store memory and the way we tell stories about things that happened to us and so on and so forth. And it has a really long lasting effect that adoption and the safety of an adoptive home does not make go away. It is a good place to, to work and process with that because hopefully there is safety and permanence in the adoptive home, but you still have to deal with the lasting aspects of trauma and the history that the child brings with them. And um, when we're talking about the impact of history, uh, sometimes people ask me, what about babies who were adopted at birth? They didn't have any trauma. And on an interpersonal level, at least as children, as babies, they probably did not, or we hope they did not. But we know today that prenatal exposures, including exposure to maternal stress um, during the pregnancy can increase the risk of a baby to have a disposition to not modulate stress very well. So it doesn't mean that if the mother is stressed in pregnancy, the child is traumatized, but it does mean that they're at a higher risk to become traumatized from stress than a child whose uh, maternal, whose, whose mother was not experiencing chronic stress during PTSD during pregnancy. So when, and we oftentimes don't know what other stressors um, children had experienced in, in utero, if it's exposure to substances, if it's exposed to malnutrition, if it's exposed to domestic violence and other things that can impact a child. Uh, a lot of children also deal with medical trauma, especially children who are coming from abusive homes or neglectful homes. And uh, for a child, medical treatment uh, does not necessarily mean that it's not traumatizing because it's done with care. Children don't understand, often don't understand what is happening, why people are doing what they're doing, why boundaries are not respected. Uh, and children who are already, um, children who are maltreated, they have less support of people who can help mitigate medical trauma. Of course, early abusive deprivation, we know impacts children history, as do the disrupted attachments throughout the um, adoption process, whether it's the initial disrupted attachment of not being with the, the family of origin or the continued disruptions that happen through uh, foster placements and moving schools and having to adapt to different caregivers and sometimes uh, also disrupted attachment from siblings and other family. And the, all the history that we may not even know of experiences that the child endured and it's not necessarily traumatic events but it can also but it does mean how the child experienced the world and what the child's experience was that was internalized and basically encoded in how they react and regulate one of the additional challenges that children are facing uh, adopted children are facing is the challenge of belonging now we all of us have things that we belong to and most of us take for granted a lot of the things that we belong to because we always had. So we're born into a certain country or culture 
a religion. We, we are spoken a certain language too as we're growing up. Uh, in my case, it was Hebrew. Um, so we, you have um, an identity that is part of who you are and who you come from and the family you belong to. And we take it for granted because that's the way it is. It's kind of normal. We can change it. We can expand it uh, over time. I mean, I'm Israeli. I'm from Israel, but I'm also a New Yorker. I've been here for a long time. So you can have your identity expand. And when we do it out of our own volition, it is not necessarily traumatic at all. It could be kind of interesting. But when it comes to children, uh, they didn't choose any of that. They did not choose to not be with the family that they had been born to. So there are aspects of belonging that um, permeate and continue through uh, uh, the lives of adopted children. Um, and it might have one or more of these um, aspects in it. It is even more pronounced when we're talking about adoptions that are transracial, trans transcultural and foreign adoptions. Um, and some of these overlap. When you have a child who can't even hide inside their own adopted family from being sort of called out and seen as not belonging. So they, <clears throat> sorry, they might look different because their skin color is different, their facial structure is different, um, other things about them are different. And when I talk about transculture, I'm also talking about the sort of, if somebody's adopted and they're a deaf child and they're adopted into a hearing family um, and so on. There's sometimes there are additional aspects of uh, culture that are involved when it's a foreign adoption. What country do you belong to? Um, the country that you were adopted into or the country that you came from? If you belong to both, you're still different because you're the only one in your family, possibly, who belongs to both. So um, you don't have somebody else that you might, that is, is like you in your own family. And those are aspects that um, can be amplified on top of the, the place you come from and the, the culture and the religion that, you, um, that you're adopted into. So it's a multi-layered challenge that seems to, it can have periods when it's not front and center, and then it can have periods when it is. Uh, we see it sort of cyclical sometimes with children oftentimes around adolescence when there's individuation and differentiation, uh, adopted children are quite different enough. Um, and sometimes that um, brings things to a head with their adoptive families, um, especially when adoptive families want to do the right thing, but don't know how to strike the right balance, if there is one, because it's a moving target, um, of respecting the culture that the child was born to and immersing the child in the culture that they are adopted into. So I want to share some um, slides of things that adoptees say um, that not all of them are transracial or transcultural, but they have to do with the aspects of, of belonging and the aspects of the struggles that they're facing um, that in their perception. It is, doesn't mean that other children, other teens don't deal with those, but for the adopted children, there's the added layer of being adopted uh, that gives that meaning to them. So when children say, I don't really belong anywhere. I belong in my adoptive family, but I also belong with the family that I came from, or I'm, I'm, I've been adopted by a white family, but I'm not white and I don't belong with whites, and I don't belong with blacks, but I belong both, but I don't really, I'm not part of anything. Or you do a lot of trying to fit in to what people think you should be. And um, children are saying, you know, I, people expect me to be a certain way and I can never be the right way, but I have to always try and figure out what are people expecting me to, to be? Am I expected to be exactly like the family that I'm adopted into? Uh, and then people say, what, you don't remember your origins? It doesn't matter where you came from. What about the culture you were born to? 
Or I'm trying to be like the culture I was born to. And then I say, what? But they adopted you and they're raising you. Why are you rejecting their culture? So there's like this push-pull that children feel, whether it is actually put upon them verbally or not, um, that is difficult. Uh, for example, like uh, children say, I can't always be grateful, you know. There's the expectation that we have that adopted children will be grateful for the home that they've been given. And they are. But they didn't ask for any of this. They didn't ask to be in a situation where they would need to be adopted. And while they feel grateful, they often also feel a lot of other feelings. They might be disappointed in some aspects of the, the home that they're in, just like any other kid can be disappointed in, in things in their life. But it's amplified because it's, they perceive that they're not allowed to be disappointed because look how much they've done for you and they came to pick you they they doing so much for you and they adopted you they didn't even have to love you they chose to love you so there's this push pull that um children are dealing with they said it was my forever home in the other home we're going to talk a little bit about dissolved adoptions which is an absolute heartbreak yet it happens and for children who had a dissolved adoption or a disrupted adoption that almost came through and then did not. Um, it's no wonder that they keep testing because the heartbreak is that, that how do they know that this forever home is forever and what does forever even mean and what does conditional really mean when there were conditions before? Our children often express that missing their biological family and it is hard when people are horrified by the kind of family you had. And how can you miss the person who beat you? How can you miss the person who, who prostituted you? And yet, that's the parent they had. And there could have been some aspects of their connection that were nice or loving or the best love that they could have had at the time. And it is hard for children to resolve it even within, within themselves, let alone some of the disgust and rage that other people express. I don't have baby pictures. That's something I've heard from several adopted children that they look at, you know, you look at family albums and it's like, oh, he looks exactly like me when I was little. Doesn't he look like his grandpa? Those kind of aspects make children feel a lot like outsiders again. Uh, and oftentimes kids who come from difficult backgrounds don't have the same kind of albums that the children in the family they're adopted into have or that their friends have. Um, so it's another highlight of their difference. They make Chinese New Year, but then I'm even more different. That's a, a, an ongoing challenge for uh, uh, children who are adopted from other cultures and their family really want to celebrate the culture that they're from and they may want to celebrate the culture that they're from. And yet that highlights their difference because they're the only one in their family who's from that culture. Sometimes he smells like my other dad. And that enters the complexity of triggers and trauma and longing and uh, mix up between who is really with me. Sometimes children say, I'm with, my, I'm with my adoptive mom, but sometimes I feel like maybe she's my other mom. And that confusion is hard and there needs to be some room for it rather than the children feeling like they can't talk about it. It's not the same when they bought you. Um, a child said that to me many years ago, and it's a child who was adopted from an orphanage um, outside of the US. And to them, even though they understood that the, the parents chose them, there was always that sense that they have to live up to the fact that they were the right choice because there were other kids in the orphanage and it's a big burden you can see that they're thinking our bio kids don't behave that way um, that children either really perceive or they believe they perceive that their adoptive parents don't treat them the same don't love them the same and would have you know would have preferred that they weren't there sometimes Sometimes it's true. Sometimes they're picking up exactly on what their parents are thinking. So when we're talking about adoption in traumatized kids, we're talking about cumulative loss. 
of the, the loss of the original family, but also the having to deal with the fact that they weren't loved enough in whatever way, even if they understand the circumstances, the end result is that they were abandoned and that there's repeated disruption, not just before the adoption, but every time that the previous life invades their current life, every time they're reminded of things that had happened to them, every time there's a, something that brings up their biological family directly or indirectly through others, there's another disruption to the, to the fact that now they're somewhere else. There is something operating in the background that is constantly there and that amplifies their differences. And it can become a challenge that makes um, adoption success difficult. It doesn't have to, but it can become, especially if it's not acknowledged. So you have this messy reality in adoption that you have some issues that are not diagnosed, either behavioral, mental, physiological, developmental issues, or relationship issues that are not diagnosed or underdiagnosed. And you kind of know about them, but you just think about them in the theory um, and the issues remain unresolved in the child, but also in the family, because the parents bring their own issues into the, into the picture. And there are different reasons why people want to adopt. Um, most of them wonderfully good, but not necessarily free of the parents' own issues and attachment issues and hopes and dreams and struggles and frustrations. Um, when that's combined with not enough preparation and not enough support for the families, um, it can make uh, this is a reality even messier. And then we add onto that societal expectations. There are expectations of the child, but there are also expectations of the family. Once adoption goes through, there's that societal expectation of, of now they're going to be all happily ever after. And look how lovely that family is. And they're such good people. They adopted. And uh, everybody's watching to see how are they going to do now. Let's see how we can grade their adoptive performance as far as uh, how well are they doing, how well are the children adjusted. And there's sort of a microscope that some adoptive families are put under. Um, and that they put themselves under. Um, and one more issue, another issue that complicates things is that there's so much that's unspoken and so much that we don't know. We don't know ahead of time because we don't always know all the issues. We don't always know all the history. And um, we sometimes don't know the things that are gonna be awoken in ourselves when um, challenges come to the front. So I, I want to talk a little bit about statistics because I've been talking about adoptions and I'm, I think some of you probably know those, some of you might not. So I wanted to share some of the statistics that we have. Uh, this is from a number of children adopted in the US in 2016. The last report is from 2018. I think another one is expected um, later this year for 2018, but that's the one that we have now. And over 57,000 children were adopted in the US in 2016. That's kind of the average-ish. And over 80% of them were children who had special needs. Different special needs could be defined from ADHD to, to developmental issues, to learning issues, to emotional issues, to handicaps, all kinds of different uh, special needs that children have, autistic kids. Um, which means these children come with an extra bag of challenges and complications. Um, a significant statistic for me is when we look at the average time from uh, termination of parental rights to the finalized adoption. It's almost a year in average, and that's just from the time that the parents term had their rights terminated. That's not from the time that a child had the attachment disrupted or from the time that they were put into care, or into the into foster system. That can be years, including different attempts at reunification. They are not always unwarranted, but from the child's point of view and the disruption to the child and the length of time of unknown, um, that is something to keep in mind 
especially when we look at sort of the ages of finalized adoptions, that's the age of finalized adoption. It doesn't tell us how long these children were in the process of being adopted. And uh, you see that a fair amount of children, um, over 14,000 children were older than nine years old. Even the, the mean age was over five and a half years old. And over 5,000 children only were adopted in their teens. So that tells you something about the history that the children are bringing into the adoption with them and the identity and belonging and cultural identity that they're bringing with them into the, adopt, uh, into the adoptive how, home and the, the history that they're carrying with them. And again, we don't know how many of those, uh, how long each one of those was in, in care. Some of those for years and years and years. Uh, I wanna touch us on foreign adoption. That fluctuates a lot depending on um, how foreign adoptions are happening and what countries allow them and don't allow them. And that's a complicated issue in of itself that I, I don't want to get into right now, but it is, um, as it is with all the complications, there were over 4,000 foreign adoptions in 2018. And if you're looking at the age groups, you can see, again, those children, by the time they're adopted, bring history with them of a place where they were, where they were born, where they were raised, who raised them, how they were raised, the things they were exposed to, the traumas that they endured, the history and culture and language uh, or delays in language and development that they bring into the, um, the adoption process. And although all of those feed into the, the risks that we have for disrupted adoption, that's disruption before the adoption is finalized or dissolved adoption, which is a breakup basically when the adoption is broken. So disrupted adoption, the, there's a star, like an asterisk next to the numbers because the nine to 15 kind of depends on how it's measured and when it's measured. And the fact that in teenagers, it's over 25%. So when we look at children in general, it's still pretty high. 15%, even 9% is a, is a lot of children. If nine out of 10, 100 children go into the process of adoption and then it does not come through. Um, and the reality of dissolved adoption, which shocked me when I first learned of the percentage, I didn't realize that at the low end, 1% of adoptions fail. Um, and that is very sobering because it's an extra heartache and heartbreak um, that we really need to do everything we can to, to mitigate. There are no national studies on, on especially not on dissolution, um, partly because children get their own social security numbers, they move on, they're not in the system anymore. So a lot of the data that is available about dissolved adoptions is from children who re-enter the foster care system or enter the foster care system if there was an adoption through private means. But then if the child enters the foster care system, that, that then they know that there's issues with the, with the adoption, but there are no good studies, national studies on that. And it's really important that we know more about what are the risks and even more important, what are the um, protective factors that can help um, prevent some of the adoption disruption and definitely the adoption disillusion. Uh, uh, dissolved adoptions are children that had dissolved adoption find it very, very difficult to adjust to new adoptive homes, and we could totally understand why. So there are different risks, and the more risks there are, the higher the likelihood of a disrupted adoption is. Some of these we can't do much about, maybe, but some of those, there are things we could do. We can help with expectations. We can help with getting more information about children. We can help with removing some of the obstacles for getting needed services after adoption. We can improve the support for families so they have uh, support ongoing. We can improve the experience of staff and the continuity of staff as much as we can. Um, so there are things that we can do to um, tackle some of these challenges. 
And some of the solutions, if we're looking at that, other than just researching and getting more information, which in of itself is important and lacking at this time, we want to have parents know how they can bolster attachment with the whole child. It's as understandable that they would feel more easily attached to the loving, sweet, compliant, happy, grateful child. But it is also important that they find a way to attach to the parts of the child that are angry and rejecting and testing and sometimes even violent and difficult. And, and those are hard because you, you don't want that part. You want the easier, um, loving, easier to be with child. Um, some of the way to help that is also to improve communication before adoption. I often consult to families before the adoption about knowing how can they communicate with the child who doesn't speak their language or uh, especially with foreign adoptions or how do you, what are the kind of things that you could do to help improve attachment in a child who might have different rules for engaging with other human beings because of the history that they had. Um, we want to improve communication and support after the adoption too, um, and stay in touch with the families or be available for communication and support long term. Because sometimes there's a long delay from the time the adoption is finalized until a child feels finally kind of safe enough to deal with the issues that they could not deal with before. And it's not a conscious choice, but it might, it might be that, you know, three years or four years after adoption, stuff comes up and everything hits the fan and you need to have a way for, ch for families to get help during these times and not feel like, oh, now we're on our own. I mean, it's four years after adoption. We're like any other family. We should deal with our own problems. Uh, we need to, I think we need to look into better collaboration between teams and also offering support for all family members. Um, because you can also have the parents might need support for issues that came to them. Um, if you look at statistic, divorce is higher in families that adopt than families that do not. And um, if you're looking also, you want to get support for the siblings because they're also put in a sort of difficult situation. They want to be a good adoptive sibling. And often they are consulted as much as parents can consult children about these life changing um, choices, but it's not easy to be the sibling of somebody who might be the special child or gets a lot of the attention or uses a lot of the resources or rejects you no matter what you're trying to do or sometimes rejects you. So the, the support for all family members and um, helping with educating educators and healthcare workers and other people uh, so they can offer the better support and societal support so we know how to help children and families reconcile some of the cultural identity differences and confusions. Those are all really important. Um, to me as a clinician, I'm looking at those and I think, you know, we really have to take this as a and and situation where we can do the most we can for the longest we can. And as a child by a child, every child is different, their history, their experiences, their family configuration, and to look at that and offer as much repair as we can. Um, because for children who come from broken histories, it is really important that we offer them opportunities to repair and repair more than we think we need to repair. So um, I spoke a little bit about that in the slide before that, but one of the strat some of those strategies are really to start even before the adoption to match our attachment activities to what's appropriate for that child, uh, sometimes age appropriate, sometimes developmentally appropriate, and to become models for regulating even beyond what we think is needed because a 10 year old usually would know how to regulate themselves, but not a 10 year old who never had the opportunity to really rely on an adult to help them regulate. Um, we want to prepare as much as we can when there are changes. These are children who had no control over their life before. So if there are changes, if there's medical care that needs to happen, if there's a move, if there, 
a lot of preparation so we can help mitigate some of the sense of helplessness and make a new way of being with that allows the children to feel that now they have more control than they had before and they're not sort of just moved along by the adults. Uh, apologies, we're not, it's not fair that adoptive parents need to apologize more than other parents, but children who've been hurt need more apologies than children who know their own worth and who did not have to deal with the fact that they'd been adopt, abandoned and harmed before. Most important from my end is that we look at behavior changes and behavior in general through the lens of communication. Children are gonna do the best they can with the tools that they have. And even the harder to accept behaviors, or maybe especially the harder to accept behaviors, are communication that we need to try and work to understand and, and help them put it in context and help them not just about the difficult behaviors, but in general, work on creating a narrative for their life uh, in spending time talking about small things that you do, creating new stories with them, because they come from a story that is broken, and we want to help them make a story that they can own, even if they can never fill up the details of their his history. Now, this last slide that I want to share is just because, I mean, we're talking about the challenges a lot, but when it comes down to it, adoption is magic in, in many ways, and it allows a lot of children who otherwise would really not be able to have um, a sense of continuity and safety of even the opportunity of growing up in a house that is good enough, as Winnicott says, um, it allows them to, to, to do that. It doesn't mean it's without challenges, but I think that on the whole, it is something that's very worthy. Um, I love this, the, these uh, quotes. I especially like the last one here that says, some days I wake up and I think it is still not okay. And then I remember and I'm home. Thank you. Time for thank questions. you, Nama. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all this important information. It was so, so important. And I just want to tell uh, all the participants that we will probably continue. So keep tracking uh, more in depth with uh, Nama. And we had a question at the beginning, Christina. I am sure that you saw it. And uh, you, can take few, you can take your time and... Um, write the questions or open the mic. Yeah, Gal, I saw that question in the beginning. Um, Nama, it says, if you have an infant or even a newborn that is born into an abusive home, do you see them having symptoms later on once they get older? Or are they young enough that they don't remember those types of things? Um, I think the, the question is yes and yes. So when we talk about memory, memory for pre-verbal stuff is tricky because you don't, oftentimes you may not have a memory as in words to describe what happened because you don't have words yet. But it, that is different than not having procedural memories or physiological memories or reactions to stresses that might um, trigger or remind the body the way that if you smell something, it might remind you of something not necessarily consciously, and you may not even know what it evokes in you. So we can see if you have, you also wanna take into account that if an infant is born into an abusive home, it's quite likely that there was abuse during the, pre the pregnancy as well. And that means that you had a really stressed out mother who might've not been able to take care of herself the way she needs to, might've needed to use substances to cope, uh, or might've, just had to deal with uh, trauma, th uh, the post-traumatic stress and or chronic stress through her pregnancy. And that predisposes that child to be more sensitive to, to trauma and to stress afterwards. Now, it does not mean that necessarily a child who was removed at birth or very soon after birth from um, an abusive home has to have long lasting, terrible, awful sequela later. But um, we know that even very early experiences with lack of regulation can impact things for the long term. And if we look at, at the reactions of 
um, and what, what, what ba how helpless babies are and how absolutely terrifying it is for a newborn to not get taken care of uh, or to be overwhelmed, then it, imp it imprints, it makes an impact. It can be repaired, uh, it can't be erased. So these are, that's my convoluted answer. Thank you. Um, so if anybody else has any more questions, please write them in the chat or feel free to open your mic. Um, Nama, I just wanna let you know some of the comments in here. This was wonderful, informative presentation, thank you. Such a sad subject, but thank you for the hope you shared. Such a good presentation. Um, and there's many more comments like that. So definitely take a moment to check them out before we go. And if no one else has any questions, Gal? If people don't have questions, but they want me to elaborate on something that uh, maybe I didn't have time to elaborate on more because I wanted to leave time for questions, then feel free to put that in the chat and I'll be happy to uh, either return to a slide that you want me to say something more about or um, elaborate on it you know, verbally without the slides. So um, feel free, you, can, you, you still have me here for a few minutes if you wanna milk information, so. We have one, Nama. Here, when you talk about long-term support, what does that consist of? Is that provided by the adoption agency? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And that's something that a lot of times people assume that there will be long-term support. And it is, it is not always that. There is sometimes support right after, like in the month right after, especially say with an international adoption, there might be connection because you need to have documentation and you need to have follow up with physicians and all kinds of different things. But when we talk about long term support, oftentimes if a child has a disability and receives disability care, then they might have some of their services provided or paid for by um, by the government. But that doesn't mean that all the needs are and oftentimes there are needs that are not. Um, and families have to basically, now this child is out of the foster care system. They're adopted in a family. They should get the care like any other child in any other family. Families that need a lot of help can get more help. And, but for the most part, families are kind of on their own, if not immediately, then shortly after. And the issue becomes harder the farther you are from the adoption. So if you have an issue that comes up right after adoption, if you know that say a child was abused and you wanna have the therapy for the child covered, you might be able to do that in some places, depends also on the state and the kind of supports there are. But if you are in, um, if it's four years down the road and the child's going into puberty and now they're acting out and they're running away from home and it might very well be related to issues pre-adoption you're kind of on your own. You're not necessarily getting this supported as part of post-adoption long-term care. Um, so these are the kind of things that I talk about the long-term to have, to have it be understood that adoption doesn't erase trauma and trauma doesn't live on a schedule. So you might have children act up right away. You might have a honeymoon period of six months or two years or four years. And then at some point, it is unrealistic for us to think that the trauma will not find, it will not try to get processed. So it's unrealistic for us to think that children will not need help with that. And that's why I think it's one of the best ways to, in my view, to mitigate some of the challenges. You can't erase them, but to support them better is to have long-term support for families and families, I mean, not just the designated patient adopted child. Thank you for that. Um, were you gonna say something else? I was gonna ask if there are other questions. Yeah, there's another Or if I answered the questions sufficiently for the person who asked it. So there is another question. What do you think would be a good message to give to pre-adoptive families to encourage them to work through their own personal loss and trauma before they begin parenting a child with a history of loss and trauma? Excellent question, thank you. I, I think part of it is putting it on the table that we all come 
into parenting or any caregiving with our own history and that adults regulate, help children regulate. So the more regulated we are, the better able we are to help children regulate. So if we're triggered and we're reactive to things that maybe we didn't process, it's going to be much harder for us to be of support to the children. So I tell children, uh, I tell parents, um, you know, you, the, the kids need you in the best place that you can be. And you owe it to yourself as their parent to work through your stuff. So you're not blindsided by your stuff when you have to also deal with their stuff. Because parents want to be there for their children first. But if their stuff rears its head, then they're sort of in that untenable place where they want to react to the child, but they're reactive themselves. So um, I think destigmatizing de it and sort of letting parents know that uh, there are, we all have issues, some bigger than others. When you're talking about parents who are adopting because they couldn't have their own kids, there are issues there. When you're talking about parents who are adopting who have their own trauma history, there are issues there. And that's just the fact. It's not about weakness or that they should be strong enough or that love should be enough. Love is lovely. It's wonderful. Um, but part of love is taking care of the parents of this child. So um, that is, that is I, I urge all fam families that are adoptive families to sort of keep it on the table. Um, to Aside from the people think that the intake is enough that they're asked all the questions and they're screened and this and if they pass the screening that means they're sane enough to to parent a child and that is more than to be fair more than most parents go through before they have a child that most people aren't screened but it is you you're already adopting somebody who has more needs in the sense of that they need more from you on the connection and relating and regulating so um it's for the child. If it's not for them, it's for the child. Thank you. Um, there is a participant asking if they will be able to get a copy of the slides. Um, um, Gal, I'm not sure how you do that. Do you, I, I can give most of the slides. The quote slides are not for circulation, but the content slides are. Um, I, can, I can send a PDF to Christina or to Gal um, and they, they have, I guess they have everybody's email address from the registration. So I'll be happy to share the PDF of the slides with the attendees. Yes, um, send it to me, send it to me and I will send them. It, it might take a day or two just because I'm going right into sessions soon. Um, but um, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Great. So do we have any more questions or we can release Nama to her other session that is coming? Release me. <laughs> I don't see any more questions right now. No, I'm, I'm happy to answer an, a couple more questions if there are. I was just teasing. Um, <laughs> I see some familiar faces, so hello to the familiar faces. <laughs> it's always nice to see familiar faces. Yeah, and, and some of them I see names that are not necessarily familiar, but that's okay too. You don't have to uh, in your pajamas. Um, as we're all now today in many places. <laughs> okay, so I think that we can say goodbye. So thank you all of you for coming and I'm glad you, you came to listen. Uh, obviously, it's a topic that I find important uh, for the kids I work with and the families I work with. And if you're here, you find it important too. So thank you. Thank you, Nama. Thank you very much. And I will be in touch. <laughs>